What's up guys, my name is Kyle, and today we are talking all about muscular and postural asymmetries. The plan for this video is to give you the four best tips that I have found to be extremely effective for both solving your postural asymmetries and muscular imbalances, but also how you can train with these imbalances and still put on substantial size, improve your strength, improve your athleticism, while simultaneously fixing some of these asymmetries through a proper strength training, weightlifting program. Now, this is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart because for the past 10 years, I dealt with right shoulder that was significantly lower than the left, a right pec that was smaller, a left quad that was smaller than the right. And quite frankly, it was a total and painted I hated it. I felt that everybody noticed and I, it, I just wanted to fix this. I wanted to be as symmetrical as possible. I did everything from all the banded work that you could think of, every BOSU ball, push up plus, pet stretches, the list goes on and on and on. I've literally tried everything in the past 10 years to find a way to make these muscles more balanced, correct my postural asymmetries and be able to do that to where I don't have to think about it. But in that pursuit, I was able to make these postural corrections, correct my muscular imbalances, control all of this subconsciously, and still make substantial strength gains, put on muscle mass, all from a well-planned and thought out weightlifting or strength training program. First best tip that I can give anyone who is trying to get rid of these postural imbalances, as well as improve their muscular physique and symmetry, is to improve the skeletal position or the joint position of each individual joint. Now that sounds super vague, but what we're basically talking about here is the position or the twists or how your body is creating leverage with the bones that are within it. Now, for example, in my case, which I had a right shoulder that was lower than the left, that meant that my pec muscle would then get a different pull or a different leverage than the left side. So whenever I would do a compound lift, a bench press, the right pec wasn't getting as much work or leverage as the left side. Hence the postural imbalance or the joint position of the shoulder then caused the muscular imbalance to develop later down the line as I continue to weight lift. So hopefully that made sense. And if you guys have questions as I go through these tips, please ask them in the comments below. I'm happy to talk about my experience and what I found to be helpful. But in improving your skeletal positioning, that means we need to do an objective assessment. So assessing your range of motion is extremely beneficial and really sets the stage for how you should be lifting in the gym, as well as the interventions that you might want to utilize. So this can look like putting your arms over your head. When you put your arms over your head, does one arm go up higher than the other? Does one side feel a little bit easier than the other? If that's the case and you're finding an asymmetry between the range of motion or flexibility between one shoulder or the other, or one hip and the other, then there's most likely some sort of restriction or asymmetry that is presenting. And if that's presenting without any weight and just against gravity, then that's most likely going to present itself when you weight lift and you'll have some sort of compensation to move around that. So this could look like whenever you bench press, you have, say, one elbow that shoots out a little bit more than the other side. That way you're picking up leverage or moving around, say, a limitation in shoulder internal rotation. So one of the ways you can assess your range of motion is to take a video of yourself and how you're moving. This will allow for you to watch and stop the video so that way you can see if there's any compensations occurring as you go. I also recommend reaching out to someone who is skilled at looking at movement assessments, posture assessments like myself, and they can sort of coach you or show you where you're compensating, give you some exercises to get rid of that compensation or improve the limitation in the range of motion or flexibility that you have. But once you do your assessment, it is then utilizing that assessment to pick out the proper positional drills or breathing exercises that can be used to reduce any restrictions that you might have in the range of motion. These positional drills or breathing drills or correctives, whatever you want to call them, they are my version of what I used to use years ago, which was pre-activation drills with bands, foam rolling, lacrosse ball, myofascial release, or even just general passive stretching. Those are all fine and dandy interventions, but I find that these positional breathing drills to be far more effective as well as a lot faster, and they really just stick a lot longer. So I look at these breathing and positioning drills as full body PNF or just isometrics that let you push into that range of motion or sort of knock at the door of whatever restriction that you might have. So for example, if you do not have the ability to get your arms overhead or say your right side is more limited than your left when you're doing this assessment, we can put you in a position, have you breathe there a couple of times and then retest and hopefully that restriction will have improved. As an, a quick analogy, 
I like to say it's knocking on the door of that restriction or knocking on the door of the house versus me just moving around it or I jump the fence and swing around the back and jump through the window. We're not trying to compensate. We're just trying to actually find a way and politely move through the restriction versus just trying to move around it and I guess break in. So this now leads me into tip number two. And this is probably the most beneficial when it comes to the gym and actually working out. And that is to use alternating or unilateral movement. So to do a quick recap, a bilateral movement is where you use both arms or both legs at the same time. This would look like a compound lift, such as a bench press, a back squat, a front squat, anything like that. Now, when it comes to unilateral, it would be, say, using one arm or one leg at a time. So a single leg lead press, a pistol squat, anything like that. Now, alternating is when you are still using both sides of the body. So say you have two dumbbells and you're doing a chest press, you would press with the left side, finish that movement, and then press with the right side immediately after, and then alternate back and forth. I find that alternating and unilateral exercises help to keep from pouring gas on the fire as many compound lifts will sort of strengthen an asymmetry that you may have. So if we go back to my right shoulder being lower, my right pec being smaller. Whenever I would bench press, I would really just continue to use the same strategy over and over and over. And I wasn't actually improving the position of my right shoulder or my right pec, but instead I was actually making it worse. This is because I'm utilizing a bunch of stabilizer muscles on that right side. I was never able to truly get the strength up on the right side. And just from a positioning standpoint, that right shoulder wasn't allowing the proper leverage from some of the bigger movers like the right pec. And it showed in my muscular imbalance. So switching over to alternating exercises and unilateral was extremely beneficial. Specifically, alternating is the most beneficial thing you can do in the gym. This is because it allows for one side to compress and the other side to expand and then go back and forth left to right. This has the same effect as when we walk or we run, which is a reciprocal motion back and forth. You're able to compress one side and then expand the other side vice versa. So if we think of my right shoulder, every time I was pressing on the right with a dumbbell and that would alternate to the left, that then was allowing for pressure management between the left and the right side throughout the set versus say if I did a bench press, I'm just pressing and all that pressure may be further down in one area versus the other side. So now that we know all the benefits of using alternating exercises or unilateral, I suggest using the 80-20 rule where 80% of your lifts are alternating or unilateral movements and only 20% are compound lifts. This allows for you to get all the great benefits of increasing strength and overloading tissue that comes with a compound lift. We follow that up with the reciprocal motion or the more human movement, if you would, of the alternating or unilateral exercises. The compound lifts will keep you from rotating. They're sort of anti-rotation movements in many ways. Whereas the alternating and unilateral movements are rotational, which is how humans move. So I utilize the 80-20 rule in my programming because I'm someone that likes a lot of rotation. It's a genetic bias that I have as well as an environmental bias just from the years of playing unilateral based or rotational sports. I played baseball, I played golf, I ran track and field where I did the 110 hurdles and I was only using my right side. So because of all this bias, I try to really follow up any compound lifts that I do with these rotational bias alternating movements. This just brings me back to neutral. It makes my body happy, keeps my joints from getting hurt in the long run, but I still am able to work the musculature, grow muscle, and overload the tissue just in a way my body accepts a little bit more than the compound lifts. Now, the 80-20 rule is not perfect. I will say it is definitely based on the individual. If you're someone who's maybe a wide infrasternal angle, you can get away with probably a ton of compound lifts, maybe a 50-50 ratio, though I'd still think you would benefit from a lot of rotation or alternating. But what I find is narrow infrasternal angles typically have a lot more of the postural imbalances, muscular imbalances, and they do really, really well with this 80-20 rule. Lastly, I will say that this 80-20 rule does change as I progress through through, say, a block of exercises. So in one block, I might be focusing on more of a beginner hypertrophy in which I'm still hanging out with that 80-20 rule. And then in the next month or the next block, I may do more compound lifts in which I'm doing 60% alternating and 40% compound lift. This is really where we get into proper periodization in a long-term program and how you can play around with some of these different factors. Okay, and on to tip number three, and that is to use constraints and machines. 
Now, a lot of people are probably thinking, what are you talking about in terms of constraints? That sounds a little weird. And holy crap, Kyle's talking about machines. Like we've all heard that in the past 10, 20 years, that machines aren't functional at all. Well, I have to 100% disagree. Machines are absolutely fantastic and constraints aren't as weird as they sound. So let's tackle these individually. So constraints are simply things that we add to an exercise. So that way you don't have to think about, say, activating a certain muscle or, or it does sort of the coaching for you. So for example, if I have someone that squats and every time they get down to depth or every time they get down to about 90 degrees, their knees fly out, their feet spin out, and they look like they're about to fall on their face. I could then add the constraint of a heel wedge and a dumbbell or a kettlebell in a goblet position, and that will then allow for them to sink lower, get to full depth that they need for the exercise, but without them having to suffer or become frustrated with the movement itself. So adding this heel wedge will allow for them to get the proper ankle mobility that they need to get to full depth, and the weight in the goblet position will allow for them to stay more vertical versus falling forward onto their face. These constraints allow them to not have to think about the form and how they're probably messing up their squat, which we all know how that feels and it can be very, very frustrating as well as demoralizing. But also you can then train more range of motion, which is better from a hypertrophy standpoint in which we're trying to balance out some of these muscular imbalances. So constraints are a wonderful tool and there's many ways you can do that. Which leads me to my next point, which is machines. Machines are basically giant constraints. Whenever I do a lead press, I don't have to really focus on a lot and the bench or the back of the lead press allows for me to complete the movement without having to bring a ton of stabilizers to the exercise. Now you're probably thinking, well, stabilizers aren't those good and we wanna train all of those when we're doing these big lifts. Yes and no. If you have postural imbalances, many of times the stabilizer muscles will act up a little too much and they try to take over because the main primary movers are smaller, not strong enough to really get the movement done. So again, we go back to the bench press example where my right shoulder is lower, my pec is smaller, it doesn't have as much strength as the left side. So what am I gonna do whenever I start to fail on the bench? I'm going to recruit my stabilizer muscles. I'm gonna get a lat, I'm gonna get a front delt, I'm gonna get all these other weird muscles that it's not really their job to help push that weight, but I drop the shoulder lower in order to get it up so that way I don't you know, drop the bar on my face or on my sternum and break a bone or something. So being able to use a machine then allows us to train these bigger muscles, which are probably the main ones that you're trying to fix in a muscular imbalance, but without having all these stabilizers kicking in to try to help out. Now, a quick little pro tip, if you can combine a unilateral or alternating movement with a machine, it is probably the best thing you can do when trying to solve both a postural and muscular imbalance. For example, if you can find a machine such as an alternating chest press, that was hands down the best thing I could have done for working my pecs, getting the right side to you know, pump up and, and gain the strength and muscle mass that it needed. So please do not be afraid of the functionality of a machine and worry about all that. They are some of the best tools that are in the gym and I cannot recommend them enough. And lastly, tip number four. And you guys are probably gonna think this is a cop out of some sort, but hear me out because all these other ones are great from a leverage and what you can do in the gym setting. But when it comes to these postural imbalances, many of times it comes from stress. For example, when I go out and I run sprints or I do extremely, extremely heavy lifting, activities that are very intense on my body, this will cause a stress pattern to occur. Her. That stress pattern for me is dropping my right shoulder. Now you might be wondering, well, Kyle, didn't you fix this? Yes, I have. I can walk around on a daily basis with my shoulders level, but still when I hit these higher level activities or more intense things where I'm having to breathe very heavy, it still comes back. And that's completely natural. That's normal. And it is my body trying to pick up leverage from the muscles it trusts. So if your goal is to be as symmetrical as possible or reduce a symmetry that you're potentially stuck in, then reducing your stress is the most key thing you could do. This is because your body will be that much more accepting of any intervention that you utilize in the future. So doubling down on how much sleep you're getting, the quality of sleep, and if you're actually getting into proper REM and deep sleep cycles, that is step number one when it comes to setting up an environment and reducing your stress. Number two, proper nutrition. If you're going to the gym and your nutrition is not on point, say you're always in a caloric deficit or you're just eating a ton of junk and your body's having trouble processing it and you're always bloated, these are factors that are gonna cause your body to have more stress. So when it comes to exercise, which is 
technically a stress on the body, a good stress that it is, if you have all this bad stress that really is just taking up your tank and it's hogging everything, then your body can't really do anything with the good stress that you're putting it through. And instead that good stress can just add on as a bad stress and it'll lock you up in your ranges of motion, in your posture, as well as other factors of your life. So please do not sleep on setting up a proper environment, your nutrition, proper sleep. Those are the foundational components. If you don't have that on lock, all the three tips that I said before this will probably not work nearly as well as they could. So in summary, we wanna have a proper skeletal positioning for each individual joint. That is, make sure they're aligned so that way muscles can get proper leverage when you work them in the gym. We then want to use alternating or unilateral movements with the 80-20 rule, so that way, whenever you do your compound lifts, you follow them up with good exercises that introduce a little bit of rotation, but still work the musculature effectively, which can also improve your range of motion and your posture, as well as the muscle leverage that you're getting. We also want to be able to take advantage of constraints, as well as machines, because adding that to this alternating or unilateral type movements just makes it that much more effective. And lastly, all those three tips before this don't matter if you don't have a proper environment set up to where your body is able to handle the stress that you're putting onto it. So sleep, nutrition, mindfulness, those all come first when you're trying to correct muscular imbalances, fixing your posture, and really progressing in the gym at all. So that is it for the day. Please let me know if you enjoyed this video down in the comments, if it was helpful, if there's anything I can cover in future videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share this with your friends. Thanks.